Good morning, good morning everyone. Um, I'm Matteo Renzi, I'm former Prime Minister of Italy, but uh, I'm here as a um, proud member of FII board. And uh, we are very happy to host here, but uh, this place is, uh, is ours, uh, uh, Jared Kushner. And uh, you listen to the presentation of uh, Jared. Jared, uh, I prefer to present, to introduce him as a peace builder because uh, we can discuss about uh, a lot of things. That is a very important event in uh, finance, investment, what, what unbelievable uh, climate, also feeling a lot of potential uh, deal, a lot of businessmen. But geopolitics plays a crucial role also in economy, of course. And last year, exactly one year ago, with Jared, we were here to discuss in the same format. We repeat the format because we are the same, a little older, <laughs> but around the world, a lot of things are changed. And particularly, my question is for Jared, what, what is the most important thing in your perception and particularly in this area has changed in the last 12 months? Yeah, so first of all, Matteo, thank you for being doing this again. It was a lot of fun last year. And uh, this year, obviously, the mood has changed a lot, uh, given the recent uh, terrorist attack in Israel, uh, which is, is really caused a lot of the progress in the region to just be reassessed for the current moment. Um, what I've seen, not just in the Middle East, but also in the world and in life, is that when the forces of good are, are winning, the forces of evil will try to stop them. And, and that's really what I believe the terrorist attack was, was meant to do. I mean, Israel's economy was, was rocking in terms of uh, all the different growth. It was a very attractive partner to a lot of people in the region. Uh, the progress between Saudi Arabia and Israel was, was progressing uh, incre incredibly well. And I do think that that poses a big threat to the forces of evil. If you have uh, the Abraham Accords continuing and, and everyone coming together, um, that's something that obviously people uh, will want to stop. So. Uh, the attacks were absolutely vicious, terrible um, that occurred, and, um, and that's really what was meant to be. So uh, still a lot of possibilities for, for progress and positivity, uh, but right now, obviously, this is a very uh, important moment uh, to, to see what's going to happen. Uh, frankly speaking, I'm, when I was prime minister, I led the government of center-left, but that don't block me when I recognize uh, the most important uh, thing uh, in the, the construction of peace in the last 10 years uh, was created by the government in which uh, Jared was involved because uh, Ibrahim Accords probably were the pillar of the future of tomorrow. The terrorist attack are impact in the Ibrahim Accords for the future. What is the situation now? You are an architect of this, uh, this very important uh, peace accord. And now, what happened? So I, I would say that in light of, of the attack, the Abraham Accords are more important than ever. And what you're seeing even here, this is the Abraham Accords, people coming together from different geographies, from different religions, from different backgrounds, trying to find a way to build ties, to make their lives better, to make their communities better, to make their countries better. And it's needed now more than ever in order to try and, and bring this forward. So like I said, when I got into the Middle East, everyone was saying the divides were the Sunni or the Shia or you know, different you know, countries. A lot of the Middle East is arbitrary lines that were drawn in you know, the early 1900s by, by the British. But the real divide that I saw in 2017, and I think that that holds even stronger today, is between the leaders who are looking to bring opportunity to their people and the leaders who are, using to use, who are looking to use religion or conflict to deflect from their own shortcomings to justify their power. And those leaders want to see more chaos, they want to see more war, more destruction. But what's shifted in the Middle East over the last five years is the progress for economic opportunity. You see what's happening here in Saudi Arabia, you see what this conference is about. But all you see from a conference like this is that the Abraham Accords are alive and well and that they are the proper answer to the, um, to the radicalization and to the deprivation of societies that has existed in the Middle East for way too long. 
and that is very interesting. I think the great division today is between the people who love the life and the people who love the death. And I think uh, we continue to work for a world in which uh, it's possible to give an opportunity for the people who love the life. But uh, when with uh, Richard uh, we decided the name, with Richard, with Yassir, we decided the name of the events, last year we talked about new disorder around the world. This year we tried to solve the problem uh, about new, di new disorder with the compass and a great uh, message, a great symbol, the compass. For the people who stay here, Jared, I think a lot of the people, particularly the people involved in business, in finance, as you, because you're also uh, involved in business and finance, the great problem is uh, to don't understand what type of compass we can use uh, to see the light at the end of the tunnel. So, what do you think is the only way to arrive to end the conflict? Because uh, the conflict here, the conflict between uh, Israel and Gaza, is a conflict who arrived after two years in which crisis in, between Russia and Ukraine, crisis in the Balkans. Unfortunately, Europe uh, is not very focused. I'm a European, I'm a great fan of the United States of Europe. But at the same time, I'm so sad to say Europe is over in this debate. There is not European great initiative, maybe only President Macron is in the region in uh, that, uh, that hours. But Balkans area, Ukrainian crisis, some tensions uh, in Southeast, problem in uh, Africa, Sub-Saharan. What is the way to end the conflict here? Because the conflict here risked to become one of the worst conflict around the world. What, what is your opinion about the possibility to finally find a solution and end of the war? So, so there's, I always say when dealing with a problem, you have to start with what you think the likely conclusion is. So uh, clearly this is one of the hardest problem sets that's existed probably in, in geopolitics, but the, the end state has to look something like this and it has to have two elements. Number one, Israel has to have the security to not be threatened by its neighbors and to be able to protect its citizens. That is absolutely crucial, has, is, is non-negotiable, uh, and I do think a lot of the world agrees that that's something that should exist. The second element is that the Palestinian people have to have the opportunity to live a better life. And I think that if you go through uh, the element, it's not just saying let's create a state, it has to be a state that can function and thrive, because if you don't create that, then the people will, again, find ways to blame other people instead of the leadership that's putting it there. And what I would say is that there's, there's fast ways to get it there, there's, there's long ways to get it there. Um, what I've learned from my time in politics is that anyone who's prognosticating and telling you what's gonna happen uh, doesn't know because at the end of the day, it's gonna be based on the decisions of humans, the people in power. I think there's a lot of um, people in power right now who are faced with some very, very difficult decisions. Um, and those are the forks in the road that, that we will take uh, throughout the course of history. And we'll, we'll look back on it and we'll evaluate those decisions. But if we ever want to achieve a solution, number one, you mentioned the Europeans, even the US, we can't do it the same way we've done it before. And again, one of the things we worked on was we put forward a plan, Peace to Prosperity in Bahrain, where we built a full economic plan for Gaza and the West Bank. And we went through a lot of the elements like no defined property rights, no judicial system, and a lot of the investors were saying, we want to invest to help the Palestinian people uh, create a million jobs, double their GDP, reduce their poverty rate in half. But the thing that was holding them back was that they didn't have an investable framework from a political point of view. So it's not just about drawing the lines, which is important. Uh, Israel has to have uh, you know, a clear security apparatus so that what happened uh, before will never happen again and that these threats uh, will reduce over time. Uh, but there has to be an opportunity for the region to thrive and for the people to live a better life. And, and I wouldn't say it's like one, two, three. I'd say it's, it's one, 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 because without all of those things, uh, you won't achieve the right outcome. I totally agree. I think the question is not the line, the frontier. The question is uh, what Jared explains very well. Israel deserves security. Palestina deserves high quality life. And both and all together, all of us deserves a, 
a great investment in the life and the future. For that, I believe uh, the real question is a cultural question, of course, when we discussed about safety and security, culture is considered a second point, not the first question. But I come from Florence, I come from Italy, and I think uh, culture is the key point. Um, just a little experience in my political life, when I was prime minister in 2015, uh, a terrible attack uh, hit uh, Paris, Paris, the Bataclan, you remember, in the 2015, two terrible attacks, terrorist attacks in uh, January, Charlie Hebdo, in November, uh, Bataclan. And we tried to give a message, very dif different uh, respect to the rest of the people, to protect ourselves from terrorists, we have to, of course, invest in security. So that means arms, that means weapons, uh, cybersecurity, et cetera, et cetera. But also invest in culture, in education. And we created a law in Italy for which every investment in security has to be balanced from an investment in culture. One euro in culture, one euro in security for every weapon a theater for every security man, uh, educator. That is very important in my view, and we copy that from a great history of the past in Florence during Renaissance. The question is for the future, not for remembering what happened in Florence or in Paris in 2015, but is the future because we discussed with Jared before to enter on the stage because both we have the same generation, he's younger than me, but we have more or less of the same generation. And uh, when we see the protests, not only in the Arabic world, but around the world, over the world, all over the world, we are touched. We are very um, uh, protests uh, against what happened uh, uh, also today. What do you think when you see protests also in the American universities or in the streets of Arabic countries? I think it's a very disturbing scenario. I mean, Hamas is a terror organization in this part of the world. They have a greater understanding for who Hamas is. It's an offshoot of the Muslim Brotherhood. And there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of um, people who are very uh, bothered by what's happening there. I will say, though, that for the people who are protesting for the Palestinian people, I do think they're missing the point, which is that um, Israel is not the reason why these people are held back and not living the life that they have the ability to become. I think a lot of the Israeli people, a lot of fair-minded people agree with the aim that the Palestinian people should live a better life, but these people, what they should be doing is protesting the Palestinian leadership. They should be protesting Hamas. They should be saying, give these people the ability to live a better life. You look at the Gaza Strip, Israel withdrew in 2005. Uh, it's beachfront property there. Nobody here is looking to go live there because it's a brutal terrorist dictatorship regime where anytime goods come into the Gaza Strip, they're not used to build hospitals or they're not used to make the people's lives better. They're build, used to build tunnels and rockets to then terrorize the neighbors. So uh, I do think that the energy could be productive if directed correctly, but the correct place to direct it is towards the Palestinian leadership and then demand that they do a better job and use the billions of dollars of international resources that have gone into it to improve the lives of the Palestinian people. And if you look at what's happening here in Saudi Arabia, you've seen over five years, you've seen a, a massive shift in the economy, you've seen a massive shift in the sentiment. So it shows that it's possible. If you have leadership, if you have the right plan, you have the right execution, you eliminate a lot of the corruption, then what you're able to put in place is an opportunity for people to then have a better life. So it can be done, it just needs the will and the international um, understanding of what the problem is so that it can go forward. And you know, one other thing that's amazing, and I, I was speaking with Richard about this, is that when we were putting together the Peace to Prosperity Summit, one of the things that came to our mind is that if you're a young a Muslim growing up in the Middle East back then, we were thinking, who are the role models? Who are the role models for these people? And a lot of what the Islamists did over the years was they would try to glorify terror and jihad and say, these are the role models. Over my time here at this conference in Saudi Arabia, I've been able to meet a ton of the younger 
entrepreneurs from Saudi Arabia. And I was thinking to myself, obviously what they're building is incredible, the businesses, they're digitizing their economy. But what struck me just in my heart was thinking, these are now becoming the role models for the next generation of youth in this part of the world. And again, that's all enabled by a good governance system, the right investment, the right leadership. And that is what should give us hope. And that's why, again, all of us coming together at a time like this shows the counter to what happens if you don't focus on capitalism, you don't focus on free markets, you don't focus on creating opportunity, then people are left with nothing. And that creates a lot more destruction and it's a negative pull on the world. That is very interesting. And uh, uh, just uh, the, the, the last two questions, but uh, before, uh, let me be very clear, it's very wonderful to listen words of hope in a moment of crisis. I believe in the worst momentum, we have the possibility to use this terrible momentum finally to give an opportunity to young Palestinians, to young Israelis, to create a new talent the world in which really the compass have to be the personal expectation of peace and prosperity. But for that, we need, we need leaders. Uh, in this part of the world, we have a Great leaders, I think you remember before Bahrain, there is here Salman, the Minister of Finance of the, the Crown Prince Salman, worked a lot with you and the other guys to uh, establish uh, peace of Ibrahim some uh, uh, months ago, and a lot of leaders in the, a lot of countries. But here in Riyadh, we share the friendship with the Crown Prince uh, uh, Mohammed bin Salman, who really was, is, and will be a change maker for a lot of reasons, not only because everyone arrived here from Europe, from uh, USA for the first time, or after some years, uh, see the very great changement in, uh, in uh, this country, but also because uh, Crown Prince uh, uh, Mohammed bin Salman tried to play a very crucial role, and I believe uh, will be one of the leaders who could change uh, the situation. What do you expect from uh, Kingdom of Saudi Arabia in the next uh, months, thinking about uh, the great expectations who a good leadership as the leadership of MBS gave not only here but around the world? Well, I think what's happened over the last five years in Saudi Arabia has changed the trajectory of the Middle East, right? So that allows things like the Abraham Accords to occur and it allows the interaction between people. What I've found is that, you know, tribalism is often what keeps people apart. And the more we can create opportunities for people to come together, get to know each other, um, that creates pe opportunity for people to build linkage. And that gives people the chance to then uh, create things, avoid conflict and create better lives. In Saudi Arabia, by turning things around this way, now there's a whole generation of people who feel very vested in the future of this country. They see that now the prosperity is, is, is available to all of them and they're working very hard to do it. And so you have a very empowered region uh, trying to reduce conflict and saying, let's build up, let's create new experiences, new opportunities for our people. And like I just said before, creating new role models for the next generation. And so that's very critical. And then on the geopolitical sense, uh, the work that they've been doing to try and figure out how to uh, help the Palestinian people have a better life and to uh, resolve the issue with Israel, uh, again, that will create stability that this region uh, has not seen in a very, very long time, and it will cement it. Again, we had things very quiet when President Trump left, and again, we, there was continuing to be momentum, but the recent terrorist attack shows that there's even a greater need for the leaders in this region to work harder to build bridges and to try to put all the forces of good and progress together and to reduce and really diminish the forces of evil. So uh, I do think there's tremendous opportunity. I think Saudi Arabia has played an amazing role in turning this region around. I think everyone who I know who comes here, they walk away saying, oh my God, this is way different um, than I expected and way different than what I experienced. And I always find too, you know, in politics or in life, when, when kind of the reality um, it outpaces the perception, uh, then you have a massive opportunity and, and here, uh, that gap is, is, is huge, and the reality keeps getting better and better every time, and then everyone who comes, their eyes are open, and they get very excited about wanting to be a part of it and seeing all the good that can come from the progress that has been made and will continue to be made. So net-net, incredibly bullish and, and grateful for 
uh, for what's happened here because it is going to make the world a much more peaceful place. Uh, I think uh, the next year we will have a lot of events in politics. But, Jared, appreciate it. I don't speak about that. I don't speak about European election, about American election, exactly in that period between. Last year, we were here to discuss. This year, we, we don't know what could happen next year after European election, American election, and uh, a lot of uh, uh, great change in the Western democracies. But next year, here in Riyadh, we will have, uh, and the Crown Prince attempted to big announcement, a very great uh, event, not in politics, but in a World Cup of eSports. It launched just uh, last Monday. And uh, I think it uh, could be very wonderful if the young guys of every corner of the world uh, have the possibility to grow up in peace and in prosperity. And why not? To try to become champions in the eSports, in sport, or in, the, in music, in every type of uh, uh, expectation of life. But if I think about next year, I have the last question for Jared, because uh, this session uh, is a session about trust. And uh, how can trust help bring uh, progress in a moment as that in which we have uh, a very fragmented world and a complicated situation. You believe it's possible to continue to have a trust on the future confidence and future and what type of trust you, you think is need, we need to create this world in which, independently from trust of a politician elections, please don't, <laughs> uh, don't tell you about it, but for the future of generation, particularly in this area. Yeah, so, so, so trust is a very simple concept, but obviously there's a lot of different uh, shades of, of what it is and, and what it can be. But what I learned from my time in politics, and I'm actually seeing that in my time in, back in the private sector, is that trust really is everything. And people have the ability to do only so much on their own, but if you start building relationships and working together, the possibilities that are achievable become endless. And I was talking with a friend of mine uh, recently who's still in government, and you know, we were talking about some of the crazy things that we pursued together that we achieved. And now that I've had the chance to step away from my time in government, it's all a little surreal for me. And I, I was saying to him, I said, why did we try to accomplish those things? Like, why weren't we intimidated by the magnitude of what they were? Because for decades, nobody had done them. All of the experts thought that those things were impossible to achieve. And I said, why did we try? And he looked at me and he said, very simple. He said, the reason why we tried was because we were talking to all the people who could influence the outcome and they were all agreeing with what we wanted to accomplish. We just all didn't know how we were gonna accomplish it or if it was possible. So I tell this story and, and it, it, when he said that, it immediately struck me and I said, he's absolutely correct because trust is really what is needed in order to create these outcomes. And so, you know, I'm an optimist. I find it's way more fun to wake up every morning being an optimist than a pessimist. But um, even when things are challenging and they emerge, if the right people in power are willing to work together and trust each other and try to do hard things, I do believe they have the ability to drive the world in a direction that will be much, much more positive. And again, I pray every morning and, and those are what my prayers for, whether it's the Jewish religion, the, the Islamic religion, we pray for peace. And, um, and it's funny how even though we're all so pious and we pray, so many people think that it's impossible to achieve. And so I do think we all have a role to play in trying to build connections and trying to get to know people who we disagree with and trying to understand with our own eyes and our own minds uh, who people are, what they really want, and then working together to try to build a better world. And that's what the people in power have the ability to do. Um, and I, I'm very grateful for all those who are trying to do it. And I pray that they have the courage and the wisdom and the determination to, uh, to, to, to give it everything that it has the potential to be. Thank you so much, Jared Kushner. We will continue as FII to offer a platform to look at the future with this trust and with this future. Thank you so much. Thank you.